Nature's Archive Podcast, a Jumpstart Nature production. My guest today is entomologist extraordinaire Eric Eaton. Eric is the well-known author of Wasps, The Astonishing Diversity of a Misunderstood Insect, and he's the co-author of the Kaufman Field Guide to Insects of North America. Today, we discuss his most recent work, Insectpedia. Insectpedia is a fascinating and non-traditional look at insects, the people who study them, and their role in history and society. In today's discussion, we spend a few minutes learning about Eric's non-traditional path to entomology and writing, and the lasting impact of one of his kindergarten teachers. And soon enough, we get into some amazing entomological facts. For example, do you know what a fly belt is? As a hint, I'll tell you it's not a leather strip used to keep a fly's pants on. Joking aside, you'll hear exactly what the fly belt is and how the titsi fly is filling a preservationist role. You'll also learn about parasitoids and specifically the differences between parasites and parasitoids. You'll hear an amazing story about how a certain wasp targets yellow jacket wasps, but only indirectly through a third-party caterpillar. Prepare to have your mind blown. And Eric tells us why aphids are actually really important to our food web. And as frequent listeners know, I love aphids because of all those links to the food web. Eric also gives us some perspective on how we as individuals can help make societal level shifts to improve our environment. And stick around to the end. He has plenty of fine book recommendations too, and all are listed in the show notes. You can find Eric at Bug Eric on Twitter, Bug underscore Eric on iNaturalist, and also on Facebook. And be sure to check out his blog, bugeric.blogspot.com. So without additional delay, Eric Eaton. Eric, welcome to Nature's Archive. Thanks for the invitation. So I've been aware of your work for quite a while. I think I first stumbled upon your name, in fact, through, it was either your blog or through some identification help on Bug Guide many years ago. So right. I'm excited to actually have a chance to pick your brain a little bit today. Oh, I look forward to it. I've heard some of your other podcasts. Uh, very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, hopefully continually improving. That's my goal <laughs> anyway. I have heard you speak previously in different forums, and as I understand it, you've had a pretty non-traditional path into entomology, and I'm wondering, can you tell me a little bit about, let's even back up further, wh you know, where did you grow up and how did you get interested in nature in the very first place? Oh, wow. Well, I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and I was an only child, and I've this is going to sound pathological, actually, but I, I really have, have never been, I've been an outcast in my peer group, let's say. And so my interest in nature to hear my mom tell it started in kindergarten. And I do vividly remember that my instructor was a gifted artist and she drew a picture of a trapdoor spider on the chalkboard one day and then explained its behavior. And I found that utterly fascinating. And I can also remember us coloring pictures of birds. The funny thing was they were all birds found in the eastern United States, not anything remotely <laughs> occurring in the Northwest. But she exposed us as a class to a lot of natural history. But the things that I gravitated towards were organisms like spiders and snakes and insects and sharks. This is way before sharks were cool. Things that were on the outskirts of human sentimentality, things most people didn't like. And what I found was that if I couldn't stand up for myself to my peers, I could research all these incredible organisms and tell them why those animals were cool. And that made me a little bit cooler too, somehow, a little, a little more, more approachable. And I got kids to look for insects during recess and things occasionally. So nature gave me an escape. My parents had a pretty tumultuous marriage getting myself out of the house was a way to alleviate exposure to that. And then being able to go exploring. And I was lucky in, in Portland in that there were a lot of wild areas very close to home that I could explore, not get lost, but still find really interesting things. And then once my parents divorced, I had mentors in teachers throughout elementary school. But then uh, when I became a teenager, my mom set out to look for other mentors for me as well. And so I met professional entomologists, became a, a member of the Oregon Entomological Society, and you know learned an awful lot through them and was encouraged by them to continue pursuing entomology in particular. Sorry to interrupt. Is, this is as a teenager that you're yeah. already, okay, so you're already, like, this is a, a very serious interest at this point. Correct. And then 
by the time I got to college, I thought I wanted to become an entomologist. But once I was in academia, I found out that I wasn't being rewarded simply for having an interest in the subject anymore. I had to start looking at it through abstraction, through lenses of statistics and these obsessions with quantification and extrapolation and abstraction. And a lot of that was indoor work. It wasn't outdoor work. And at that time, which was the early 1980s, molecular biology was starting to gain a lot of traction and field biology was starting to fall by the wayside. And so the timing was just awful. I wasn't able to articulate that at the time. I just had this overwhelming frustration. I've never been good at math. <laughs> I, I avoided statistics and, and physics and things that, that in retrospect, I wish I had pursued a little bit at least so I could talk better to scientists. But I have always been a writer and I really never identified myself that way. I enjoyed writing, but I felt that I had to have credentials in the scientific world to give credibility to my writing, basically. And by my fourth year in, in college, I moved out of entomology and into recreation resource management, which is where park rangers and those kinds of people graduated. And I wound up not receiving any degree at all. But in hindsight, most of the you know, park ranger types and naturalists that I am friends with now are at a desk also, and they're training volunteers to do what they used to do in interpreting natural history for the public. So it wasn't really until my early 50s that I realized I'm a writer. I've always been a writer. I'm good at it. I'm a good science communicator. I've Having talked with another podcast group, is three hosts, and they do Arthropod is their podcast. And they made me realize that I've been a witness to and participant in the evolution of science communication from the dark ages of slide projectors through, through the digital age that we're currently in. And I really hadn't thought of that before. That makes me pretty unique that I've spanned this era of two very different approaches to science communication. And now I think we're in a third wave of that where we're focusing, rightly so, on diversifying the voices that you hear in science communication in terms of ethnicity, non-binary people, transgender people, and these demographics that have been marginalized, if not outright excluded. And we're also much more aware of people with disabilities. How do we accommodate them much better in the conversation and in terms of experiencing nature? There's a new group called Bird Ability, all one word. And if you haven't talked to anybody from there, please do so, because they're at the forefront now of leading advocacy for disabled persons in birding. But I think you can extrapolate that to nature study in, in general, nature recreation. I like where we're going and I hope to become a bigger voice for those marginalized people and not only make room for them, but start suggesting individuals to give presentations at birding festivals and things of this nature. Hey, nature enthusiast. Do you want to be part of something bigger? Well, we're building a movement at Jumpstart Nature, and we've just added some new volunteers to help with our podcast and website. But this means our costs are going up too. I need to purchase software licenses to give them access to the production tools we use. For example, one media editing license costs $21 a month. And this is where you come in. Please consider supporting our mission by contributing to Jumpstart Nature through our Patreon or direct contributions, or even purchasing some logo merch. Check out all these options at jumpstartnature.com slash donate, also linked in the show notes. Not ready to make a financial contribution? Then please share this episode with three friends. Sharing what we do is actually one of the very best ways you can help us. Thank you all for your continued support. That's great. And I actually, I know you've been advocating for more diversity. So I was hoping to ask you about some recommendations as to who, you know, whose voices should be amplified a bit, who I should have on the show. So Birdability, yeah, I've, it's funny you say that. I've seen some of their work, but I haven't connected the dots and, and thought, oh, that would be a great topic for here. Backing up a little bit, have you ever had an opportunity to go back and speak to that kindergarten teacher and let them know like, how big of an influence those drawings and and so forth were to you oh boy she has since passed on 
of course. You know, I'm 61 years old myself now, but <laughs> I'm trying to recall, I may have, but yes. I'm certain that my mother made it very clear to her what an influence she was. And that's fine with me. My, my mom was very good at, at expressing gratitude and making sure that I did the same. I have to imagine how fulfilling that would be as a teacher to understand how that simple little action, you know, led to this cascade of events. And your writing is something that has really drawn me to you. That's probably a good transition to the first book that I encountered of yours, which was not your first book, but the first one that I purchased was during the pandemic. It was uh, Wasps, subtitled The Astonishing Diversity of a Misunderstood Insect. And I really enjoyed the book because that hit me about the time where I was really understanding the diversity of wasps for myself. I was making my own personal discoveries. And what I really like about it is it's like a coffee table book in a way. You can open to any page and there's a subject and you can read that subject in a few minutes, see some amazing photography and walk away having learned something. For me anyway, it begs the question of how did that format come to be? Oh, excellent question. Publishing has become a very complicated arena and it's not, writers still send out queries, nonfiction writers certainly do, and book proposals whereby you have not yet written the book. You are interested in finding somebody willing to publish it before you start writing the entire thing, but you do have to do due diligence in, in writing a, a, a proposal. In this case, the publisher came to me and it was someone who I had been familiar with when she was at another press in the United Kingdom. And when she co-founded Unipress books, she came to me with an idea for writing a book on social insects and not just ants and bees that we know of as social insects, but, but social insects in other orders like beetles and things of this nature. And she had also mentioned that she had an, another author already lined up to do a book on wasps. And I wrote her back and I said, well, that's too bad because I'd feel more comfortable writing about wasps than I would social insects, although I could do that. It just take a little more research. And eventually, long story short, the person that she had contracted with to do the book on wasps decided not to do that. And so she asked if I would be interested in that. And I said, yes. Then I still had to write a proposal, lay the book out organizationally, and then we took it from there because it had to pass their editorial board still. But basically, Unipress is a publishing partner. They don't do the hard copy publication themselves. They do they package the book, and then they shop for a publications partner. And that's how we came upon Princeton University Press having an interest in this. It was a long process. The hardest part probably was I enjoyed researching the book, and I learned an awful lot, as you should if you're writing a book, if you do due diligence. But the hardest part was probably finding photos because it, to be cost effective, most publishers rely on stockhouse photography. And when it comes to entomology, you are guaranteed to have the majority of photos you get from stockhouses be misidentified, even up to the order of the insect. So you have flies that they're passing off as wasps and that kind of thing. And so not only did I have to find photos that I thought were captivating, but then if they were misidentified, I had to go back and try and find out, okay, what is this thing really? And I haven't been out of the country. So for things from Africa and Australia and, and South America and what have you, I had to do a lot of research hmm. just to identify the, the thing. But we wanted to make sure that our illustrations were, were at the forefront of the book because we wanted people to be captivated. We want colorful things demonstrating behaviors that were unique to wasps and enthralling for, for people to observe. So that was our goal. And from what I'm hearing, we achieved most of that, at least. For me, certainly, it is uh, it is a captivating book and it is very accessible. And especially for something like wasp, it's in the subtitle, A Misunderstood Insect. And the wasp that most people think of are the more aggressive social wasps. And there's this amazing diversity that exists from gall forming wasps to sand wasps. You can just go on and on. Oh, by the way, and something else I was going to say that's great about the book is you get into some wasp adjacent topics like mimicry. And the, some of the things that just blew my mind was how some moths and katydids actually mimic wasps, which 
just blew my mind. I, I there's a lot of mimicry in nature. I had no idea that it extended to moths and katydids <laughs> mimicking a wasp. Oh, yeah, even true bugs, and right down not to just to looking visually like them, but behaving like them, which is even more astonishing. And that's harder to communicate in a, a non-video <laughs> way. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to include that because number one, the people that go out into their garden are, are likely to mistake many flies and other insects for wasps. But also it amplifies how successful wasps are because they've got all these other insects mimicking them. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a real testament to the fact that you've been a successful organism when evolution is is co-evolving other insects to look like you. Absolutely. And I have really grown to love the uh, cinepid wasps that produce galls. And uh, in fact, had an episode on, on gall forming a while ago, and it's springtime here. The spring galls are out in force at this point. So I'm looking forward to uh, seeing what awaits me this year. The other question this sort of begs is, are wasps favorite taxa of yours, or do you have a favorite taxa? <laughs> huh. I tell people that if I'm being honest, I probably got interested in wasps because nobody could call me a sissy for collecting an insect that could fight back. And I haven't gotten stung that many times collecting wasps, actually, but that's probably how it started a little bit. But then the more I learned about them, the more I learned about how complicated their behaviors are, how much diversity there is that just got the ball rolling even further mm. yeah i would have to say they're they're definitely a favorite just because of their sheer diversity and and complexity i it's ironic that a couple months ago i i've learned about an online a virtual wasp identification course that covered wasps from all over the world and indeed the participants in this workshop were from all over the globe as well and while we were doing the course Papers came out identifying two new families of wasps. So that's how fast the science is moving. And there's already plans to do a revised edition of this workshop in 2023. And yeah, it, it's just, yeah, I told Allie Ward on ologies. I told her, I said, at the end of the day, I just went around the room picking up the pieces of my mind that had been blown out that day <laughs> from doing research. Like you mentioned the gall wasps. I was having a hard time getting my head around alternation of generations because some species of gall wasps can produce females parthenogenically. And because of the way the genetics work in Hymenoptera, I didn't see how that was possible. And so I reached out to people who were, were working on this and they're like, well, if it's any comfort to you, we have no idea what's going on. I, you know, there's still so much Left to discover, even with all the advances in our technology and the tools we have to look at things, we still have no idea really what's going on. Yeah, it doesn't take too much thinking to realize how much work there is to do still when you consider the millions of species of arthropods that exist in the world and uh, the amount of work that goes into doing genetic testing, looking at, at the genomics of each species, trying to see how they're related. And then you get into to gall wasps and if they're morphologically are different from season to season, <laughs> connecting those dots. It's, it's just so much work to do. And oh. before I forget, I, I will definitely link to your interview on ologies. I, that was a great interview and I'm a huge fan of ologies. I think that Allie Ward somehow manages to link together a little bit of, of like fun and goofiness with, with good science and uh, it makes for a really enjoyable listen. So I'll include that in the show notes for sure. And the reason why I reached out to you ultimately was you have a new book right around the corner called Insectpedia. And just to be clear, that's not Insectopedia, it's Insectpedia, correct? Correct. And it, it looks like another interesting format, another unique or innovative way to approach a an immense topic. So can you tell me a little bit about the book? Who's your target reader? What are you looking to accomplish with it? Well, this was another situation in which the publisher reached out to me when we got WASPs going. My editor at Princeton University Press said, oh, by the way, we're doing this, the, the Pedia series. And he said, I don't know if you've seen Fungipedia. That was the first one in the series, but we want to do one on insects. Could you write that for us? And so he sent me a copy of Fungipedia and the whole series, by the way, even if you're not interested in insects, please pick up another uh, one of the Pedia series. It, it's just this really unique combination of topics related to the subject itself, short biographies of people that have influenced 
the science, tangential topics like how things figure in entertainment and the arts. And so it, it presented a really u- unique challenge as well as an opportunity to cross-pollinate with different subjects. So if, if somebody's not interested in insects just for their own sake, you'll find entries in this thing that, that talk about insects in art and insects in literature and you know, how insects impact us economically, both positively and negatively. And and just and weird stories that you can scarcely believe that it's a nonfiction book. If you read some of these stories, I can hardly believe it myself. And I know some of these people that have researched these topics. Yeah, it's meant to be entertaining as well as educational. And I think Publishers Weekly just wrote a review about it saying basically it's full of humor as well as insight. And that was my goal is to, you know, it, it's always been my interest to educate people in an entertaining fashion. And insects certainly give multiple opportunities for that. So it's such a wide variety of topics. I think Princeton University Press uh, calls this series compendiums, if that's a plural. I'm not sure what the plural of compendium is, actually. Uh, (laughs) Compendia, I don't know. But in any event, yeah, it's touching on social impacts, historical impacts, uh, the people, some natural history, of course, in there. So just give me a flavor for yourself, a career entomologist of a few decades. How much research did you have to do for a book like this? Like, I, I'm just wondering, is it just top of head knowledge or do you have the ideas? Or are you out there searching for new ideas to include in the book? I, I, I can't, basically what I'm saying is I can't really fathom what it'd be like to be someone in your position who has accumulated all this knowledge over the years and then how that translates into the creation process. Wow. Uh, lots of back there. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of all of the above, actually. Yeah, certainly I have knowledge of the basic. Okay. My goals, probably threefold. Number one, give people a basic knowledge of entomology and what it means so that you can go from there to anything else related to entomology that strikes your interest. I talk about metamorphosis, for example. I talk about taxonomic classification, economic entomology, integrated pest management, that kind of thing. So if your interest is in in one of those areas, the entries there give you a a real basic snapshot of that kind of thing. And then you can go from there. And then my other goal was to bring to light people and aspects of entomology that, that have flown under the radar. And that includes people of color, women, and the idea of ecosystem services, which are services that insects provide that we traditionally have not put a monetary value on. So they don't go into our cost benefit analysis very often. Things like pollination, decomposition and disposal of organic waste. That's another big one there. Seed dispersal. A lot of insects are responsible for dispersing seeds, especially ants. So yeah, basically introducing people to, to aspects of entomology that might not have thought about previously and people involved in the science that that have flown under the radar. So yeah, I, I have to hand it to Princeton University Press because I have ideas and perspectives that I'm not aware a lot of other people share and that might go against the grain a little bit for traditional entomology, especially economic entomology. And they let those things into the book. And I'm very encouraged by that because I think we need a lot more participants in the discussion who may, may not have, who may see things differently than people that stand to gain financially or academically that can introduce new aspects to, to discussions that impact us. Can you give me an example of something that you were happy to see Princeton allow through to the final publication? Yeah. I'm most of of this goes to the prologue and the epilogue in the book. But we, a lot of our knowledge of entomology, especially in non-Western regions, the neotropics, Africa, Asia, has come, well, Australia has come from colonialism. And we don't really think about that. When we go to a museum and, and look at their collections, we don't tend to think about how were these objects and artifacts and specimens obtained, well, it was through colonialism. And probably, I don't think it's a stretch to say we did not give due respect to the indigenous peoples who made that possible or who we fought to get these 
specimens that we brought back to our Western countries and nations. And we certainly didn't respect indigenous information and knowledge and use of a lot of these species. And so ethnobotany, for example, I, I, th- I think that's finally starting to gain some traction that, okay, maybe these medicine men actually were onto some things. The origins of a lot of, of things, especially in medicine and in food and agriculture, we're not giving indigenous peoples nearly enough respect, if any respect. And I'm, I'm really encouraged by people like yourself and Alan Ward and, and other podcasters uh, who and people in social media on Twitter and Facebook who are saying, hey, let's look at this. Let's listen to some other voices for a change. And that's one of my goals in the future of my own career is to get out of the way. As much as I like seeing my own work in print, it's easily as gratifying, if not more so, to to help somebody else get their voice out there. And so probably, I know I'm getting a little bit off topic here, but that's one of the The aspects of my career I want to do more of, and that is advocate for these other voices, help them amplify their voices, find them publishers too. Yeah. So to an earlier question, you said, wow, there's a lot to unpack there. And and I'm thinking everything you just said, there's so much to unpack. Yeah. Just like some of the thoughts that were streaming through my head as you were describing this is, is, yeah, back in colonial times, there were expeditions to go yeah. collect samples, and they were oftentimes ruthless in yeah. their behavior on those expeditions. Jumping to, there's this promising drug that is starting to to make some headlines called rapamycin that is based on a fungus that was discovered on Easter Island. I think the island is like Rapamui in the uh, indigenous language. But it's turned out to be really beneficial in a number of different ways that really aren't understood. And one of the early correlations was simply that the people that lived there had a longer, healthier lifespan. And then they figured out that this is in the soil. And now they're trying to, to go backwards and figure out what are the actual biological pathways that enable it to, to work? How does it work? And we could just go on and on. On the topic, maybe of a little bit of natural history. Yeah, I looked at some of the preview pages that are available in Insectpedia, and there were some really tantalizing topics in there, but it's only a few pages of preview. So I was hoping maybe I could ask you, like, what were some of the more interesting natural history aspects that you profiled in the book? You pick oh, one or you want two. Me to give some secrets away now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it could be from the preview pages. I, I actually have not seen the preview pages you're you're talking about. Actually, here's an interesting thing that happened during the publication of the book, I had an entry for the gypsy moth and it's still in there. But between when I wrote that uh, story and that little entry, and when I got to look at the proofs for the whole book, there had been an upheaval about that name, gypsy moth, because gypsy is an epithet, uh, a racial slur for the Romani people. And this is a great example of how things are thankfully progressing. So a group of graduate students, it's my understanding, went to the Entomological Society of America and said, we need to change the name of this moth and the common name. The the scientific names are not as mutable as common names. So the scientific name for the gypsy moth is Lymantria dispar. That's going to remain the case unless the genus name changes for some reason because it gets lumped with another one. I don't see that happening. But the common name can certainly be changed at will. And so the the students lobbied to have it changed. And the interim name they gave the gypsy moth was the LD moth for Lymantria dispar. So I said, okay, I guess I got to run with that because that's all that's available right now. So I changed the whole entry to reflect that. And now since the book is supposed to come out on May 3rd is my understanding, since that happened, the name has now been changed to the spongy moth as a reference to the spongy egg masses that the females create after mating. It's it's akin to changing the name of your school mascot if it was the Braves or Indians or whatever. It's a very small token step to more systemic changes that we need to see, but it's a start. And there's a movement, again, in the birding community. The birding community leads the way in a lot of this kind of thing. And I, I'm hoping the entomological community can catch up to them. But there's a, a movement called Bird Names for Birds out there now. And so a lot of these names attached to either some of the ruthless 
<laughs> explorers we mentioned, or just people, slave owners, that kind of thing. We're trying to remove those names from the common names of some of these organisms, but to reflect our respect for you know indigenous peoples and people of color, et cetera. And I, th I think that's a good start. Obviously, we need much greater movement in social justice and, and what have you. But it's good. The more we get that kind of thing into the public sphere and publicize it, the better. So that was one thing that changed during the process of making this book, which is just astonishing to me. But then we have things like the tsetse fly in Africa. It's actually over 20 different species, if I recall correctly. And they occupy equatorial Africa below the Sahara Desert in what's called a fly belt. And different TC flies occupy different habitats from you know, savanna grassland to you know wetlands. And the between the wet and dry season, the, the fly bell either expands when it's the wet season or contracts during the dry season. And indigenous livestock herders know this. And so that's why they move their livestock flocks because the the fly the fly is well known for transmitting sleeping sickness to humans, which is caused by a, a microbial uh, organism called a trypanosome. But in livestock, it's called nagana, and it has it, it can be a lethal thing. Now, the wildlife of Africa has immunity, relative immunity to nagana. So it has, wildlife has free reign, no matter whether the flies are occupying the ecosystem at that time or not. But people that herd livestock there that are vulnerable to nagana must move their livestock accordingly. And this is all going to be complicated now by climate change because you're going to see much more volatile weather over the seasons. And it may be that the dry season will extend more or the wet season more depending on climate change. But while obviously people who herd livestock consider the fly a pest, wildlife conservationists might look at the TC fly as a savior because it's keeping competing grazing animals out of these areas where wildlife needs to graze. And certainly if, if you extrapolate to, to corporate ranching, that's extremely important because otherwise, if you didn't have the TC there, certainly the savanna would be capitalized upon by the, the ranching industry. Our view of what is a pest, what is not a pest depends a lot on perspective. And I think the, the TC fly is a good illustration of that. Yeah, that's interesting. It's a uh, forcing function in, in a way to make the right thing happen. Maybe we can just hit a couple other interesting topics. I don't know if they're in the book or not, but one one topic that I've always found really fascinating is hyperparasitoids or hyperparasitoidism. And I know you see that in different insect species. So are there what might an observer be able to find if they're out in nature that would be reflective of hyperparasitoidism? And if that's too specific, I can take a step back and just let you talk about some example. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think of even I've ever seen an example of hyperparasitoidism. Let's start, start with parasitoids. Yeah, that was something relatively new to me when I was, you know, started the wasps book was, you know, I, I knew what a parasite was. A, a parasite was something that that lives in or on a host, usually without killing it, but sometimes it killed it. It turns out that a parasitoid is a parasite that almost always kills its host. And so the majority of insects that we know of as parasites are actually parasitoids, and, and they usually result in the mortality of their host. How people figured out some of these relationships or pathways, I should say, to hyperparasitoidism, it just... I have no idea. It, it, it must have taken Houdini to figure this out because the, the first one I heard about was when I was still in Oregon and it's a wasp called a trigonalid. And the species up there are, I guess they're still technically parasitoids of yellow jackets, but they don't get there the way you would think. They are not brave enough to enter the nest of the yellow jacket and lay their eggs. So what the female trigonella does is she lays hundreds, if not thousands of eggs on foliage. And these eggs are, have a hard capsule and they're meant to be consumed by caterpillars or sawfly larvae. And so these eggs are, are consumed by the caterpillar or insect larva and nothing happens unless a yellow jacket comes along and grabs that caterpillar, chews it into a pulp 
and takes it back to the nest to feed the yellow jacket grubs. And then there, the eggs inside the caterpillar are ingested by the yellow jacket larva, and then they emerge into the trigonaled wasp larva, <laughs> which feeds on the yellow jacket grub. Yeah, I, I, and so that means not only is there luck involved, but that means the majority of time it's probably not working. That, I guess, is what boggles my mind is how can something so convoluted with this infinitesimal percent of possible success endure and things be perfectly fine? I think that's a, a good testament to not only the ingenuity of nature through evolution, but just the in endurance and durability of nature in the face of all these things that, that other organisms throw at it, including us. <laughs> So, yeah, talk about mind being blown. To your point, A, the people who discovered this, that's amazing. Like, how is that possible? Because it's also happening on small scale and so infrequently. But then when you think about the traditional narrative around evolution and selective pressure, and now you have this very indirect relationship, and it, it really, it, in my engineering-centric mind is really struggling with how does evolutionary pressure <laughs> lead to this outcome? It's just crazy. Yeah. There's to add a little bit onto that. There are some hyperparasitoids that are termed obligatory, meaning that unless all the sequences, all the steps in the sequence happen, then it's a fail to what we call facultative hyperparasitoidism, where, okay, if all the steps in the sequence don't happen, I can still make use of this interim host. And so you have that happening with, with things like a certain ichneumon wasps or braconid wasps or tachinid flies or things of that nature, whereby they can skate by if their intended target never materializes. <laughs> but so there are, there are exceptions to the idea that it all has to fall into place. But for obligatory hyperparasitoids, it does hmm. all have to happen that way. Yeah. And, and, then, and then the other part of my mind is just thinking again about all of the millions of species and thus trillions upon trillions of relationships that exist that, yeah, there's going to be a few random things that happen occasionally too in that mix. But yeah, this sounds more than random. It's too coincidental. And, you know, I began this with a bit of an ignorant question about, like, you know, can we observe hyperparasitoidism? And just starting out with, and, and I'm, I apologize to my listeners because they, I think they understand how much I love my backyard aphids at this point. And, and I mean that seriously. <laughs> I enjoy seeing aphids in the backyard because there's always something interesting that happens when you have aphids, like lacewings come along or lady beetles or wasps come along. And next thing you know, you have this sort of enlarged carcass of an aphid with a little trap door <laughs> that has been chewed away as evidence that something happened. Can you tell me a bit about what's going on there? Oh, okay. What's happening there is that there's a little tiny wasp that's even a, smaller than the aphid, and it's a braconid. And actually, there's braconids, and then there's another whole family of wasps that does the same thing that are not braconids, but they're related to them. And so she, she doesn't have a stinger, as most wasps do not, by the way. They have an egg-laying organ called an ovipositor. And for wasps that sting... The sting is the modified ovipositor that has now become weaponized for mostly for paralyzing prey that she then provisions for her offspring. But in the case of things like ichneumon wasps and braconids and the really microscopic hymenoptera, they have ovipositors. And so she uses her ovipositor to lay an egg inside the aphid. She injects it in there. And aphids are pretty defenseless, usually. So this is not a real huge ask. But she, she lays an egg in there, and her offspring then eat the aphid from the inside out, and in fact, never exit as a larva. And so they're consuming the aphid inside, and in the process of that, it bloats the aphid into that mummy that you described. Then the mature larva pupates, turns into a pupa. And then when it's ready to emerge as the adult wasp, the adult wasp chews that circular hatch top or back end of the aphid and comes blasting out. And, and you've got what looks like a door in a dead aphid. And 
the other interesting thing about aphids is that they typically are most abundant in early spring and late fall. And in the course of feeding, aphids excrete copious amounts of liquid waste called honeydew. It's very sugary, it's full of carbohydrates, and it is craved by everything from ants and bees to flies and wasps and even butterflies. And whoever the, the marketers were for the aphids to name it honeydew, they were that was masterful. <laughs> it's waste <laughs> yeah, after all. Right? Yeah, yeah. If you ever park your car under a tree full of aphids, you're probably not too enamored with honeydew. But <laughs> but so think about it. In early spring and late fall, there's not a lot of flowers around producing nectar. So if you're spraying for aphids, you're you're not only doing an exercise in futility because they're very good at reproducing as many insects are, but you're robbing all these other insects of a really vital energy source right before they go into hibernation or into a mating frenzy to get the females through to the next generation, that kind of thing. Yeah. Aphids really important source of fuel for other insects, not just the aphids themselves, but the waste products they produce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's the you mentioned the the craving that ants have, and and there's yeah. you know probably not time to go into the stories of how ants can <laughs> ranch or farm aphids, but th but that's another really fun one, and and you start to talk about spraying for aphids, and that might be a good segue into you had mentioned when we were talking in advance of this the double edged sword of chemical pest control, and I was intrigued by where you wanted to go with that, so I'll just ask you what would you like to say? <laughs> oh, it's it's. The, the history of this is as far back as the agricultural revolution. The way I see it, every revolution in terms of our civilization magnifies the previous revolution. So you had the agricultural revolution, which seems legitimate. We got to eat after all. But then it became exercise in monoculture. Then we had the industrial revolution, and that brought with it the ability to mechanize agriculture and expand its scale even further. And after World War II, we were using very potent insecticides on these monocultures because there were no reservoirs around our croplands for natural pest control like the wasps we were talking about and, and lady beetles and things of this nature. So we had to become reliant on chemical treatments because there was no other way to effectively control pests. Now we have the digital age and we're automating a lot of mechanical ways of harvesting and, and planting and what have you. So we're getting further and further away from an interaction with our food. We're not, we don't get our hands dirty much anymore, which I think is one bad thing about the course of agriculture. But the other aspect of this besides scale at a unsustainable level is that what we do on in agriculture, our, our methodology for that trickles down to the homeowner and their garden or yard. And we become conditioned as consumers to believe that the solution to any problem is either a product or sometimes a service. And so we don't stop and think about maybe, hmm, maybe I need to learn more about this. Maybe it really isn't even a problem. But if it is, maybe there's a different way I can handle this other than running to the hardware store and getting a pesticide. That's where we have to start interrupting our culture based on this economic reflex to treat every problem with a product or call somebody with a service to intervene. And so that's where I think we need to, to make the big shift. It has to come at a consumer level because certainly in our, our current government industrial complex. We have way too much influence from the corporate sector on regulation or deregulation or unregulation would be their ideal on our lawmakers. So we as consumers have to take more responsibility and maybe taking a moment to think about whether we really need a product or a service and then act accordingly. Certainly there's situations where you have to have professional help. <laughs> I do not recommend taking down a hornet nest by yourself, <laughs> for example, or certainly not, it's impossible to treat termites if you have them in your structure without a professional help and without chemical controls. But you can go a long way to preventing that by not having mulch at your foundation, not stacking your firewood up against your house, 
really basic things like this. And so that's where I think we need to, to make an emphasis. We need to start relaxing weed ordinances that prevent us from growing native plants or maybe even having our own vegetable gardens. We need to, to do more local agriculture. As consumers, we need to patronize our local uh, farmers more than we do. I'm, I'm lucky right now to be living in, in relatively rural Northeast Kansas, not too far from Kansas City, but we have a farmer's market in our town during the summer months where we can get locally produced produce, even meats. Those are the kinds of things that we need to do, create community gardens. And this is being done. So I'm very optimistic if we can keep that train going and build up some steam for it, that we will start shrinking away from agribusiness and start looking at local agriculture, stop investing as much in processed foods, which is where most of agriculture goes to now, I think, probably. And I like chips as much as the next guy, but you know, I'd rather have more intact ecosystems. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, we have to prioritize and then act accordingly as as consumers. I think the way that we do act today is out of momentum and a path of least resistance. And you know, the these things are sold as being yeah. easy. And uh, unfortunately, we aren't thinking about the trade-offs that are inherent to every decision that we make and the trade-offs to uh, having a lawn or putting fertilizer down or putting chemicals down every six weeks as a as a certain lawn care provider likes to market heavily on uh, on TV. Yeah, everything has a trade-off. And when the trade-offs are one or two steps removed, it's really easy to ignore them. So Eric, I, as is often the case, I wish we had double or triple the time to, to just keep going, but uh, all good things must come to an end. But before we end, I would love to hear, thinking back in your evolution as a science communicator, a writer, an entomologist, are there any top of head events like a book or a wildlife encounter or a mentor or something along those lines that really help to escalate your interest or your knowledge in the space? Oh, mentors too numerous to name. And I keep adding to them. Unfortunately, the older mentors are, are falling now, of course. But Mike Hauk, who was a person at the Portland Audubon Society, gave me my first writing break when he invited me to volunteer to write for a publication called The Urban Naturalist, which is now defunct, but it's been turned into a couple of editions of Wild in the City by or Oregon Historical Society Press. I, I worked on the first one. I did not work on the newer edition, but that was where I had to start writing regularly. And so that was a really good exercise. He also let me illustrate the things I wrote. Robert Michael Pyle has been a longtime mentor. He's best known as a butterfly expert and author of many fine books like Mariposa Road, The Thunder Tree, Where Bigfoot Walks. He's been very encouraging, but also a great example of diversification without losing one's power in their writing. So he goes out of his comfort zone and still writes exceptional material. But I remember when I was in college taking biology and in our lab, one of our TAs started each session by reading from the book Lives of a Cell by Lewis Thomas. And Lewis Thomas, the late Lewis Thomas was at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, but he was able to, a genius level physician, but was able to write for the public in a very captivating manner. And he likened the, the, the title essay, Lives of a Cell, he, he likened the earth to a single celled organism. And he did that extraordinarily convincingly. And I subsequently read his other books including late night thoughts while listening to Mahler's Ninth Symphony. <laughs> but these are the, they're great because these essays are easily readable in, in, in a matter of minutes, but they'll leave you thinking for forever. Wendell Berry, another author I would highly recommend. He's also a poet, but he's written many fine books of essays like What Are People For? He comes from rural Kentucky. And he's all about landscape level ecology and impacts from external sources and things of this nature. I highly recommend his work as well. Those are some new ones for me. I've, I heard a couple that were familiar and a couple that are new. So I'm looking forward to checking them out and we'll link to, a, to them. And how about upcoming projects? Anything you'd like to highlight? Like we didn't even talk about your blog and you have a couple blogs, <laughs> in fact. Yeah, I'm, I'm not blogging as frequently as I would like, but my two blogs are Bug Eric dot blogspot.com 
And that's where my entomology things go. And mostly what I'm trying to do at this point is help promote other people's efforts now. I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to entertain guest blogs if I find you and I find that that you've got something unique to say or you're very good at saying it, I will come to you. And my other blog is senseofmisplaced.blogspot.com. And that's where I, I go off on tangents that may or may not be related to insects. It's more about, it varies, maybe pandemic oriented, or maybe it's, I haven't done anything yet on the what's happening in Ukraine, but you know, certainly a lot about consumerism and how to how do we get beyond that or how do we change it in a way that is more sustainable, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of different topics there. It's more personal too in, in terms of my experiences and viewpoints. But as far as books go, yeah, I'm, I, it already took me a little while to, to get back into the Insectpedia mode because I wrote that two years ago. But yeah, the author is always thinking another book or two ahead of what they have just done. And then there's projects you can't talk about because you're under non-disclosure agreements and things of that nature. So I will probably get back to you when I have something more tangible. (laughs) That works. And the easy thing to do would would be for people just to follow you on your blog or on social media. And I'm sure you'll announce when things are ready to be announced. So how can they do that? This is true. Yeah, this is true. I'm I'm, uh, Bug Eric on Twitter. And I'm at bug underscore Eric on iNaturalist, which is a a great website for recording your own observations wherever you are from or traveling through. I am not on Instagram. They kicked me off for reasons that I can't understand and wouldn't let me get back on. I do have a Flickr photo stream that I think I'm bug Eric there as well. Basically, if you (laughs) Google bug Eric, you can find me almost anywhere. I'm Eric R. Eaton Writer on Facebook. All right. So with that, is there anything else that you would like to say? Just thank you again for engaging. And I, I'm always delighted by when I run across people like yourself who are yourselves insightful and ask probing questions and are eager to to do the kind of thing I'm doing, which is educating people while entertaining them as well. And and it, people that can make me think harder, who challenge my perspectives, I always, I always value that. So thank you. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you for taking the time out of your day and doing this. I'm, as I said at the beginning, very excited to have this opportunity with you and hopefully people listening gained a little bit of value from it as well. So thanks again. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for sticking through the entire episode. If you made it this far, I hope that it means that you enjoyed it. If so, please spread the word and share this episode with three friends or groups that you think would enjoy it too. As for today's episode, let me know. Did I miss anything? Was there a topic I should have covered? Let me know at podcast at jumpstartnature.com or DM me on any of my social accounts. I'll do my best to answer your questions. You can find me at Nature's Archive, one word, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I also share photography, nature stories, and much more on those accounts, so you can follow just to stay in touch, too. And despite being called crazy by numerous friends and colleagues, last year I left my tech career behind to start Jumpstart Nature, which Nature's Archive is now part of. For the sake of myself, my family, and the planet, I need to make this work, so please also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash jumpstartnature. I offer some exclusive content and perks, and you can start donations as low as $4 a month. Lastly, please also check out our latest creation. It's the Jumpstart Nature podcast. We just completed our pilot season where each episode reveals an unseen, surprising, or misunderstood nature topic with the help of experts and our host, Griff Griffith. It's entertaining and inspiring and even reached number three on the Apple Nature podcast charts. There's much more on our roadmap, but we need your support. So check out jumpstartnature.com for more details. Thank you. Thank you.